Hello, welcome to the uh, October 26th, 2022 Environmental Management Commission meeting. Um, we appear to have quorum, although we expect a couple of commissioners to join us a little late. Um, but I think we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, I am Georgine Adams uh, from District 9 and the chair of the EMC. Uh, so welcome. Um, we'll go through and identify the people who are on the commission. Um, you can wave your hand so people can recognize you who are online. Elise Robinson is from District 2. Uh, we actually have sneaking in to get a hint um, candidate for District 3. Uh, Del, and I'm going to say your name wrong. Otsuka. Otsuka. Um, she hopefully will be confirmed at the November 2nd council meeting. And uh, try not to scare off so that she will <laughs> continue to be a candidate for the EMC. Um, next to me is uh, John Olson from District 4. Um, Melissa Cardwell will be joining us a little late, um, but hopefully we'll see her. Um, Dee Fulton is from District 7. Hey, Dee. Uh, Rick Gaffney, District 8. Hi, Rick. Um, so again, I am, I'm not sure where John uh, Burns from District 1 or Lee McIntosh from District 6 is, but I'll introduce them when I see them. Um, so the first business is to um, approve the minutes from our last meeting of September 28th. Can I get a motion to approve? So moved. I'm moved. Oh, second. Yeah, second. Okay. <laughs> Got those two covered. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Seeing none, take a vote. All in favor of adopting the September 28 minutes, say aye. 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 D. You're muted. I wasn't present and thus I have no comment on the meeting. Okay, you're still welcome to identify typos and misstatements. Um, I approve. <laughs> thank you, <laughs> the minutes are approved. Um, I also wanna thank Peter Sir, our uh, dedicated secretary who makes sure that the transcription that, that automatically writes up the words of the meeting has some really extraordinary um, interpretations of what you said, uh, some of which are even obscene, and he catches them usually. Uh, so it is important to read the, the minutes, if only to make sure that they were accurately saying what you said. Um, anyway, uh, statement from the chair. I'm excited that we're going to have uh, our vacancy filled and uh, have some trepidation of uh, people who are rolling off the, the commission. And certainly if you know people who would be interested um, from your districts, uh, seven and eight in particular, uh, talk up your buds and uh, get them interested in participating. Um, Hopefully we'll have some uh, good uh, time allowed for discussion with DEM. Uh, I know Ramsey's around and hopefully will join us soon. Um, so I think it, it should be a, a, a um, good informative meeting today. Uh, next on the agenda, item four, public statements. Um, we did receive seven written statements. Uh, if anybody wishes to um, also address their comments. Oh, I see Lee McIntosh um, from District 6. Thanks, Lee, for joining us. Um, so is there anybody uh, online on the meeting? There's no one here who wants to give um, public testimony. And you can give it now, or you can wait until we hit the uh, item that you would like to talk to when we get to it. 
So any, I'm not seeing anybody asking to give public testimony at this time. Um, and I, I do wanna thank uh, those who submitted the, uh, the written comments uh, and I hope everybody here has had a chance to read through them uh, and sincerely support public um, providing comments. We do read them, we do consider them, and they do influence um, what we uh, do on this commission. Um, I'm going to move to item five, which is unfinished business. And I have an Ramsey... Is, are you on? Yes, I am. Yes, you are. Okay, my my continuing. I promise to have it on the agenda every time. Uh, where's the pretreatment rule? Uh, the pretreatment still. Um, I guess next time I need to have Chris, Chris Laudy. He's uh, he's the person that working on the pretreatment. Uh, it's still going back and forth, trying to define some of the requirements with the um, Department of Health and Malia, our county council. So that's still in progress. But once we get the green light to share it with you and the committee from our uh, corporation council, we'll, we'll share it, of course. Okay. I'm just, I'm going to keep it on the front burner every time. Uh, the next item is uh, five two, which are the proposed dates and locations for 2023 meetings. Um, we discussed last time how <laughs> awkward it is to uh, have conflicts with the uh, commissioners and how can we balance it and, and make sure that we hear from um, the, the people who really care. Um, so the proposal that's in the package sent out uh, was going on Elisa's recommendation to alternate on the fourth Wednesday or the fourth Tuesday. Um, in addition, we'd be hopping between Kona, which is where um, John and I are right now, um, and Hilo, uh, and then Peter will find us rooms. But not in cement, not a final decision. If you guys want to try it, I think we're in the mode of trying an experiment for next year to see if that schedule works. Um, and if it doesn't, we'll change back and to the fourth Wednesday. Um, we do have the the date set by um, or the the fourth Wednesday set in our rules which means if we do want to permanently change, we would need to go through a rulemaking proposal comment and then issue a final rule process. But I think right now, and Kara Wong is our, our corporate counsel uh, in the corner, at least on the screen I'm looking at, um, is when we decide to permanently change that time, if we do, we would need to go through rulemaking, but we can try an experiment at the beginning of uh, next year and see how it works out. Correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, so long as the agenda is timely posted um, and shows a location, it's fine. Um, and the rules also give you a little bit of flexibility. So it says the meeting shall be held on a monthly basis on the fourth Wednesday, alternating between Hilo and Kona, unless otherwise specified by the commission. So it gives you that flexibility. Um, so it's fine for now. Um, if it's going to be a permanent thing, then we can look at rule changing um, sometime next year. Okay. So uh, does anybody have a, a better recommendation? Or are you willing to give it a try? Those changes were to accommodate the commissioners that weren't are not here today. I'm not here they? <laughs> so that makes it kind of difficult. Okay. Well, maybe we can re-ask the question if they show up, but looking at the the people who are here um are there any issues with us trying this alternate schedule okay. well i think that's just you and me georgine well, no lee's there in the corner oh and lee yeah <laughs> and john so we do we oh. do have quorum okay. um so let's go ahead and we'll give it a tr try 
um, our first meeting in January is the fourth Wednesday. So um, that's as normal any rate. Um, and we'll just see how it goes. Again, once Melissa and maybe John, um, who teaches Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so Wednesdays are difficult for him. Um, if he, they join, then we can ask the question again, okay? Moving on. Um, much of last meeting was discussing the uh, imminent, although we don't know when, uh, uh, issuing of a recycle grant, recycling infrastructure grant by the EPA for large money. And we want to be prepared to um, submit the recommendations or, or a grant application if we can uh, for this quote unquote free money. Um, and what I would like to do is um, hear from uh, DEM on where you might be uh, in terms of what would you want to go to for on a grant and whether or not it's likely you're going to be able to get a grant writer to put together a proposal. Do you know? Oh, we have with us, I should say, Michael Rivera, uh, the new solid waste um, chief. And thank you for joining us. And Ramsey, if, if you know. Yeah, definitely. Since our last meeting, um, the EMC meeting, um, I know council member Inaba and uh, Tim Richards um, were involved as, as well in trying to make sure that we continue chasing some of that funding and the grant writer, uh, securing grant writer to assist the department. So Brenda, our deputy director, um, has been exchanging emails with R&D and council members and definitely um, R&D are willing to pay to secure the grant writer. So it's a matter of uh, us trying to find um, somebody with that experience so they could, um, so R&D could start the process and they, they are on board um, and they're willing to fund that, that, uh, that position as well, but it's gonna be under R&D. As you all know, uh, R&D department is the department for the county that's set to chase uh, loans, grants for the entire county. So, but we're gonna continue working with R&D and try to push that as well. Okay. Um, and I, I should also introduce uh, Craig Kawaguchi is uh, the acting recycling coordinator not sure. Is that your title? Yeah. Say hi, Craig. Okay. Can you hear me now? You're muted. Now you're not. Now you are. Okay. You can go. you hear me? <laughs> we can Hello? hear you now. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just teeing into the position right now. Okay. Great. Well, welcome. I know uh, it's going to be tough. Um, Craig comes from managing the High Five program, as I understand it. If you uh, want yeah. to give us a little bit of your background. Um, so since 2004, since the Bottleville program started, I've been with the county and managing the um, program on island with a coworker in Kona. And prior to that, I worked at um, KRRC. And I think that's where I met John Olson. So I worked there in the beginning. And then also while going to school on the mainland, college on the mainland, I worked at the Campus Recycling and uh, Redemption Center. Great. Well, the, the biggest issue in my mind about this grant, great, you're going to get a grant writer, but the writer has to know for what. You've got to, to pick the program that you'd like to go to. Um, has DEM uh, teed up? The priorities for what you would go for a grant for? Any of you guys from DEM? Yeah, Georgia, and like I said, um, we are Brenda and Senna, they worked with R&D, so now we transition and uh, 
Greg will be working with um, Brenda and R and D um, to to chase some of that money, and it's it just being very hard to secure any grant writers. So if any one of you guys know there's somebody out there with experience in grant writing, uh, please um, advise them to submit their application to the County of Hawaii R&D Division Department. Um, it's just, we've been trying to get some staffing and in this situation, we may uh, continue working with R&D, trying to figure out maybe we'll go through a private third party that uh, like um, Dig Deep, um, we, ha we had him last year for the wastewater. They did some, some chemical kind of analysis for us, but um, they consider it to be the expert in that type of you know, field. So, and we're gonna continue recommending to R&D maybe utilize these type of consultant in the meantime. Well, I just um, my own personal feeling on it is that um, a grant writer will write up whatever it is your program is. Um, they really shouldn't be the one picking the program. Um, so if anybody's going to be involved in picking the program, it would be this uh, commission, um, possibly uh, public input. We got a, a great uh, summary report that was submitted by um, Zero Waste uh, Big Island that had lots and lots of ideas. And then I uh, put in our, our meeting packet uh, a draft of some recommendations from my side. And if you would like to go through and discuss them, or if you have other ideas, um, I'm uh, more than open to hearing them. Uh, there were some, several of the written testimonies were supportive of what I'd put in, but I'd like to hear from the rest of you. Um, maybe what I could do is just read through the, the recommendations, give a little bit more of the concepts I was heading for. Um, but regardless of what project or projects the DEM decides to go through, DEM needs to describe and commit to staffing and implementing the grant if they get it. I mean, the whole trick of writing a grant is convincing the grantor that you know what you're doing with this money. And it isn't going to be, well, no, what do we do? When we do, we just got the money. Um, no, you need to upfront say, we could, we can fund people, we can staff it, we know where we want to go over a period of time. So one idea that I had that was um, included in the, the zero waste package uh, and has been in numerous uh, solid waste management plans and, and talked about for decades, right, John, oh. is, <laughs> is the idea of a resource recovery park where it'd be kind of a one-stop shop. You'd take your stuff um, to be recycled and divvy it up. There are lots of different models now on the mainland uh, where you can kind of drive through and drop off your cardboard here, drop off your plastic there, drop off your scrap metal over here, um, take your broken printer, which I have sitting in my bedroom right now on the floor, uh, and, and go to the fix-it shop and figure out whether or not I can figure out what it means when it says a printer head is not working. Um, so you'd have a whole series of uh, operations that would be available in a big enough space where it'd be safe. You could even maybe drive a trailer through um, and think about how can we over time with a grant um, come up with uh, a way to, to pilot uh, an honest to goodness resource recovery part. Um, there's a lot to it, a lot of different ways it can be constructed, but that would be uh, a fairly major grant because we'd be talking about equipment and land and building structures um, to house all this stuff as well as staff. So one idea. Second one that um, was in the ISWMP for 2019 
and that was making the transfer stations legally available to small businesses to use for recycling purposes, not waste, recycling purposes. Um, there, <clears throat> we don't really know what all the small businesses are doing relative to recycling, um, but I'm sure there are some opportunities there. Uh, it wouldn't even have to be free. There could be a small fee and, and permits associated with it. But that'd be another kind of, of uh, grant possibility. Um, the third would be around composting, uh, doing uh, home compost bins giveaway that we did in, in the eons past, um, different kinds of shredders. There's a lot of talk now about shredding paper and cardboard so that you can incorporate it into compost. Um, and the uh, experiment going on here in Kona, um, seeing how that works. But it needs equipment, it needs space to do things. Um, they're also the larger in-vessel um, composters. So there's, there's a whole variety of things and there are various proposals that have been made uh, for uh, application here in the county, but as well as across the mainland on how you could build a, a district, uh, I'm losing the word, distributed composting operations around the island. The first one about the resource recovery park, it was pick one, I said KO, but it could be at Hilo and, and do a pilot, see how to do it before you start popping them around the different parts of the island. I'm on the west side. Yeah, it'd be nice to have one on the west side too, but let's do at least one and see if we could make that work. Same thing with composting. Over time, you could build out and make uh, a distributed compost facility uh, operation. Um, but that's going to take commitment, coordination, wonderful opportunities for private and public um, cooperation to do that. And last but not least, I threw on there is the catch all of uh, we've got contracts with waste management to handle our landfill, but waste management does an awful lot in the recycling arena on the mainland. Um, and Hawaii Earth Recycling, not resources, that was my mistake. Um, I think of it as just H-E-R and forgot what the R stood for. Um, they might have some things in the bag already where they would have done on the mainland and elsewhere um, that they could help put together uh, a grant program. So those are my four wish list things that, that I came up with. If people have thoughts about any of them or have your own ideas, uh, I think it would be at least helpful to provide to DEM, where would we like to see them go for uh, a grant project? Well, <clears throat> John Olson. It, it appears that you have you you pulled the genie out of the out of the bottle. You mentioned the Kao uh, project, and there is actually a plan floating around there somewhere <laughs> um, that we had done as a function of a civil rights complaint that we had filed, and everything that you just mentioned plus. There's a piece of paper that covers it in that plan, because what it was intended to do was look at a build-out scenario for Kuna. I mean, you know, we have 80,000 TMKs floating around out there. And that's, that's the, that will be the gorilla, <laughs> you know, in the cage. And the planning to do that is already is already a done deal. Uh, of course, it, it it's in, twenty years old or more. So, but it was needs, based on it a build be, out. It was yeah. based on a build. The number of TMKs that already this isn't. We're going to go and subdivide something. These TMKs are existing, mm -hmm. and the people are already paying taxes on that land. At almost as if they lived there. There may not be a house, but nonetheless, they're having to contribute something, even for owning vacant land. So there is there is some kind of a, a cash flow there existing. 
So it would be interesting to see if we could maybe give that. And of course, now Pune is the most populated district on the island as of the last rolling census. Well, and, and there, there are plans that have been proposed in the past. It would be going with the latest and greatest information that's been developed. Yeah, it all has to be updated. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Elise Robinson. Uh, John, I um, want to clarify. So there is a plan out there um, for the KL transfer station. And it sounds like part of expanding the transfer station includes acquiring private property in that That's plan? correct. Yes. OK. And, and so I thought about that, too, as Georgine, you're mentioning the priorities um, from testimony. Realistically, if we receive the windfall or the DM received the windfall of the grant, um, what is what could a realistic time frame be to actually see this implemented if it's going to take requiring property, um, building, expanding roads or building more buildings or, you know, covered spaces, um, the things that were outlined in the solid waste plan too. Okay. Are we talking about you know, five years, it could, could it happen in a year? And I'm curious well, the, about, go ahead. The, my understanding of the grant is that it, it is over five years or it can be up to five years and then Congress has got to go find more money um, so that you could phase it. And it would be, how, how would you set it down so that maybe you'd build another warehouse or maybe you'd use Hilo because they've already the county already has the land I don't know um so it's it's looking at how would you bring that into um fruition and hopefully to the point where it's self-sustaining um and how far can you go in a five-year period or maybe go ahead and plan it out longer than that but know that you'd have the seed money from the grant to get you going and to see whether or not what works and where's the right place it ought to be. How do we work in so the community and the businesses are able to make it run? Um, you were over here nodding. Um, Michael, did you have some comment? No, no, I was just agreeing with, with the plan. I like everything that's been uh, stated so far. It's just um, building a plan and, and developing the resources for the division to be able to handle the grants or projects that are set forth in, in the planning. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it here, so it's, it's going to take time and planning. And, and how do you do that? That's going to be the, that's going to be the key versus reacting to it. And, um, it's all good. You know, the, the items in the, the SWMP are very good, but the division itself needs <clears throat> to really focus in order to execute that plan effectively, uh, look at employee retention, some hiring and staffing. And, mm -hmm. and with that, as I've driven in my short time around the island, is uh, revigorizing the equipment in, in our uh, land. It, it, it needs uh, to be updated, our equipment in some of the areas, uh, the transfer stations, the chutes need to be updated <laughs> and, and, and stuff like that. And then it, you have to fundamentally do that before we can execute a resource park and some of those other items that are that I see that are out there they're very good I, I like it it's a, a really good plan for the for the island but fundamentally there are some things that the vision has to do in order to to execute that uh successfully that that's just my opinion on that. no I like I said that was my biggest concern is you don't just say I want to build a mansion um and, and I get this money and it's done deal. No, yeah. no, there's an awful lot. Infrastructure is the supporting labor and equipment that'll, that will make it happen and not just fritter away the, the money. Oh, we do have some testimony. You can give it to <laughs> no, okay. I also, before I let you go, um, Melissa Cardwell is uh, now with us. Um, from uh, District 5. Welcome, Melissa. Um, so, public testimony on this item. Okay. Oh, did I come out behind you? 
we can bring down some data. Would you want this thing? Would you want this? <laughs> Aloha, good morning. Um, I'm Christine Kubat. I'm the executive director of Recycle Hawaii and um, have some things to add to this discussion. So first thing is that the issue that uh, John Olson brings up about this uh, long-standing case um, happened a long time ago about what was happening in Puna is actually very important because one of the important guidelines criteria for this grant is an environmental and social justice component. So for the community to have had this history of, you know, um, the way the planning was developed, the way the infrastructure was created, uh, created a disadvantage for that community, which is also a very low income community, will actually um, score points on the county application. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is I believe it would be inappropriate to partner with waste management or HER on the grant application because it would be like pre, I, th I think you would run afoul of procurement laws. So to collaborate at the beginning on an application, you're basically going in saying this money is going to come to the county and then we're going to share it with these um, private contractors. I think it would have to be neutral. And then whoever was going to participate would have to apply to or respond to an RFP later. I think one of the smartest things the county could do is look at that $10 million that was previously allocated for a composting facility. Now we're kind of have a lot of consensus around this idea of a small scale distributed system. Um, that money is probably just an idea at this point. I don't really know what happened with it. I guess, Mike, you could help us track that down. Sure. But the uh, NOFO hasn't come out yet, so we don't know what the matching requirement would be. And somehow, if this um, $10 million is still available, this would be a very smart way for the, comp the county to leverage that to get more money or to perhaps spend less but this is a way to make that $10 million that the county was gonna spend on that other idea go a lot further on an idea that would work better. Um, the idea of a resource recovery park is something that we've been working on at Recycle Hawaii. So again, there might be an opportunity for the county not to necessarily take it on and build it, but to say that um, we're going to fund or we're gonna put out an RFP to the private sector and then waste management, HER, some of the partners Recycle Hawaii is working with, whatever, we could actually respond to that. Um, and then maybe part of that would be the county would just say, okay, well, we're going to give you space, you know? Because when we're out there talking to people, does that mean I should stop? Three seconds. Oh, I have three seconds. Uh, <laughs> when we are out there talking to people, what we hear now uh, most is people need covered space. There could be a lot more resource recovery, a lot more diversion, but what's what people are desperate for is covered space. So to the extent that the county could provide that, I think you'd have a lot of people from the private sector willing to salvage materials, process them, stockpile them, and then move them back into the economy. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Are there other comments from the commissioners on what you'd like to see? the DEM go for on this uh, grant possibly? Um, wait, excuse me, Georgine, this is yeah. Kira. Um, is there any other public testimony? Uh, no. Okay, then we should close uh, close public testimony, Georgine. Okay, um, I'm closing public comment on this item. Uh, hello, Georgine, this is Brenda Yokepa Moses. I, I have joined you or me and um, Ramsey, unfortunately have to divide and conquer on some of these meetings. Um, but I'm here and I could give you a brief update on what we're working on with um, our grant initiatives. If you want to um, just let you know, I'm here. Okay. Any, any commissioners had comment about grant possibilities? Well, I mean, let me just start it down this road. So we might as well get to the end of it. Um, when we did the proposal for the KL transfer station conversion, um, because it was a, pretty much an open-ended grant, 
we looked at all of the existing available sites on the island and you know the criteria of access uh, community acceptance. We went down a, a whole long list of issues that we felt should be addressed in terms of, of siting. And the, the KAO site continued to come to the top because of all of the above. In other words, there's land available. Uh, the connectivity was planned at the point we started planning this highway 130 was not actually a highway into Buna. <laughs> it, it was a substandard two-lane road and it and there is a plan to enhance that to a four-lane road and in theory the county at some point is going to build another two-lane road going out of down old government beach road to Hilo and that is an alignment that does exist but it has never been improved. So the connectivity there is, is even further enhanced. Uh, water, power, all of those things are readily available there. I can, I can go on, but I won't. Um, as a starting point, if we could get a hold of those, the, the document, and I don't know who's sitting on a copy of that at the moment, I bet it was in that container. Uh, well, Where it is now, I have no idea. Uh, I know that a lot of people had them. And I wouldn't be surprised it's even in the dungeons of the county building that there isn't some copies of it because they were co-conspirators. <laughs> so um, it certainly would be nice if you could try digging through and see if you could find it. But that was like the early 2000s. Oh, it was before that. Oh, I mean, the actual report and the grant that got given, as far as I could track it, went back to 2002, 2003. Yeah. So presumably there's records, maybe. Yeah, we started on in the mid 90s. Yeah. So anyway, that again, there may be some homework already done that just could be updated. Uh, so you wouldn't be working totally from scratch. And, Rick Gaffney, are you? Oh, not done. Well, and just to, to finish up here and just using that document and seeing where else it could now be applied um, using the criteria that was developed, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. We've got the wheel. So let's see if we can make it roll. Okay. Rick Gaffney, you had comment. Yeah, I, um, because this uh, apparent hesitation or doubt about availability of grant writers um, I did a pretty simple exercise. I Googled wastewater grant writers. Um, there's 9 million responses to that on Google, um, but the, just the ones on the, on the front page are national companies that specialize in this. Um, and then for, out of further curiosity, I Googled um, waste grant writers Honolulu. And guess what? There's grant writers that specialize in waste in Honolulu. So if there aren't any on this island, and that's as far as we've reached, um, I, I would suggest we go um, off island and whether, I don't know whether there's any um, anything that would prevent us from using a national company, but one of the things you get with the national company is expertise in how other counties has, have successfully pursued these particular kinds of grants, because they're clearly in that list, there are companies that specialize in wastewater or just waste. So um, I think we need to reach further than uh, just hoping somebody will show up um, out of the blue in this county and actually go get somebody from somewhere else that has the expertise already. Thank you. Uh, Elise, you had more comments? Oh, actually, I think Melissa had her hand up before I did. Oh, sorry. Yours is in a white space, Melissa. It's hard to see. Uh, okay, Melissa, go for it. Thanks, Elise. I appreciate it. Um, I want to apologize for being late. And um, 
I, I basically just want to give a plug for this grant. I know I missed the first part of this discussion. Um, it just I, I wanted to say it at the last meeting, but it's been coming up for me that, you know, we talk a lot about all of these different goals that we want to accomplish and how it always comes down to money and not having enough money to do these things. You know, all of the goals that were laid out, you know, that you worked on Georgine and the ISWMP and it just seems like, you know, now we have this opportunity for this money and um, I just really hope that that we go for it. And I just wanted to, I don't know if everyone saw, but in the chat, um, Jennifer Navarro just said that they have identified grant writers um, on the, on this island that could work on this opportunity. So, um, so there, there we have it. Great. Thank you. Elise. So speaking to grant writers, I think um, Rick had brought up in the last meeting that the county has approved, or maybe it was Ramsey, um, hiring grant writers through R&D. So if, if R&D has not hired grant writers, which I don't think they have, um, is it likely that the council would approve money for the, the DEM to source their own grant writer? I'm not sure. Or, or I guess I doubt I doubt it. And and even if we we know people here on the island that are grant writers, I wonder if the way that that things have have been intended to um, be carried out is is they must be employed by the county through R and D to write the grant for anything the county wants to go for. Brenda, maybe you could uh, answer that. Yeah, um, thank you. I hear all of you guys, and we, we've worked with previous grant writer that tried to establish what grants would be most, the low hanging fruits with the staff that we have, because it's not only about money um, and, and the need for us to have money, we have to have the staff to support and to get these grants out. So um, so to answer that question, yeah, r and is having a hard time um, getting grant writers. And so we know time is of essence. So I've asked if we could get a portion of that grant write your money from the mayor's office, which they have, which they have agreed to, which the allotment would be 25,000, which is how much the professional services we, we can do without having to go through all of the, you know, all of the, the, the recru recruitments. And so we're hoping um, that we're working with R&D right now. They've agreed to that, that allotment. We're hoping that our dig deep that has initially done the foundation work for us will be the successful professional service provider for us, depending on their schedule, so they can kind of take off where they left off before. Um, so that's in the works right now. We should be receiving that any time um, and getting those, getting those, um, that getting that help um, for us. And just to let, just for Rick Gaffney's, uh, um, of course, we didn't limit it to the island here. There's a bunch of procurement things that that R and D had to go through, and there wasn't any successful people that came on board. Um, I dig deep. I think they're based in California, so of course we, you know, we we reached out to whoever could give us the the best service, and they were they were very um, helpful to us. So we're looking forward to using them again. Um, I understand that. Mike Rivera has to leave in 10 minutes or less. Like Ramsey, another meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Is there, uh, are you not coming back? No, I'll be back, but I don't know if I'll be back for the end of the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, looking ahead on the um, item six on reports and correspondence and the, uh, we had asked for some information from you, we being me, um, asked for some information about costs and whether you would have time to do that or if you'd like to cover it next meeting or just I, I, hand it to me or- well, I can hand it to you. Or go, you know, I, I, I can, don't- I can I can explain it real quick and okay. then I can get leave this for you. All right, if it's okay with everybody, I would like Mike take advantage of his being here um, to jump to, Items Roman numeral six two two, uh, which is where I was trying to get information on costs, with the idea of unless we can package information about how much it really costs for us to manage our um, both recycling and um, solid waste disposal, 
uh, so that we communicate it to the public. It's hard to tell people we need help and you need to help pay for this because it isn't free like you think it is when you go to the transfer station. So what do you have? Just, just real quickly, I, I didn't know exactly what you were looking for on, on this. So I, I just broke it out in a general overview. And if you need it more detailed, I, I can go into that aspect of it. But just to answer the questions, what is the net cost for the county? I basically just took what the tons were accepted at, at the West Hawaii landfill, took the revenue and broke it down. I work, my mind works in cost per ton to break that out. It, it's very simple for me. And if you take the revenue divided by the tonnage there uh, for, for uh, the county, it's $62.64 in, in monies generated per ton. Now, the payout to waste management is this is what we pay. It's almost about a million a month based on the same tons. It equates to almost $50 a ton is what, what, you're, what you're paying out to waste management. If you add the two, it's about $112. And our gate fee through the gate is $116 to waste management or when we come through the gate every day. So if you need it broken out more than that, I can, I can do that. But, but for itself, the division works within the budget. So I tried to break that out for you in terms of solid waste and recycling. So based going into this year, it's almost $39 million is the bud budget for solid waste. And for recycling, it's about 6.7 million for a total of about $45.6 million is what we operate uh, solid waste and recycling in the, in the county of Hawaii. So with that, you wanted a breakdown Number two, uh, how do we recycle different materials left at solid waste facilities? This is where it gets interesting. This is, I highlighted hazardous waste because you asked for hazardous waste on the, on the backside. But for green waste, uh, some of the items are budgeted and in what the fiscal year monies were spent versus the budget, that's fiscal year 2021 and 22 versus the budget and how many tons comes in. Again, I work in cost per ton because it's easier and it, and it shows you how much we're really spending on, on some of the items for green waste. So for green waste, you take the, the monies divided by the tons and you get hundred almost $27 a ton to, to work with green waste with HER uh, for us. And then that diversion is almost 72%. So for household hazardous waste, so that's a, this, this number is very low, 51 tons for a, a capita of almost 200,000 in the island. We should be up more around 100, 200 tons for generation in this island. So there's some work to be done there. Uh, but that, if you equate that with the cost there, it's almost $5,000 a ton to get rid of electronic waste, computer waste, all that material. It's very expensive to move it off island. So there's an extensive cost to the county to process that materials. And then collect and haul uh, is the same thing. And the other interesting thing if you look down on this is, is e-waste, is, that's computers. You have one, a printer sitting at home. It's almost $1,100 there per ton for the county uh, to pay and process that materials there. And I broke it out. This is in a spreadsheet so I can get it out to you. And it, it creates the diversion factors that I think you were looking for on that. So if you go down, well, one more thing on this spreadsheet is that the outreach, we only spent a couple thousand dollars off the budget. So I know that was item one, one of your items for education outreach and public awareness. There's definitely a, an improvement there that we can do. Uh, looking at this chart initially, there's there's some low hanging fruit that we I could work with Craig and uh, Brenda and the staff here to increase that awareness so we can get more household hazardous waste, whether it's e-waste and, and work on that community awareness to increase that that diversion for, for, for the division, because there's a lot of opportunities here uh, to, to do better for recycling. Great. And I know Christine over there will be pretty happy <laughs> if we do that. Kind of there's there's <laughs> also, as I understand it, a second EPA grant around education and outreach. Yes. So there's another shot at doing what ISWMP list as the number one priority, and that's education and outreach. Um, and this was meant to be part of gathering that information uh, so that we could say how much we're really spending. And the caveat is we only spend as much as we get. That's right. <laughs> so we're, we're supposed to be at zero-based budgeting here. So the issue is we could do more, but we need to have more money to be able to do more. 
So if you, if you take all that, that chart and you add it all together with the tons and you do the division and, and take what the recycling department actually spent, uh, it's actually a diversion rate of almost 20% on the island. Uh, with that, 80% of that is going to landfill. The rest of it goes to landfill, our, our waste material. So there's a definite opportunity there to increase recycle awareness, to increase the recycling opportunities on the island so we can increase the diversion rate and decrease the amount of material C and D. There's, there's a lot of opportunities there for us to increase uh, that. Where all the household hazardous waste is going at 51 tons, that you know, you raise questions there on what's happening with that material. So uh, that's what it does. It equates out for to, to recycling diversion in the county, 109, about 109 dollars per ton for all that material there. So it's pretty expensive to do recycling on the island, and there's lots of opportunity to do the outreach. It's very effective if you do it right and focus on the items that that are listed here that we can go after low hanging fruit. And then we work, work on the staffing, employee retention, hiring and building and, and replacing infrastructure and equipment. And then we'll start building all these successful things that I heard earlier with resource parks and, and composting. I really like the home composting units. They're very successful. They work a lot, especially on an island like this with has which is pretty green. Uh, did a couple of pilot programs back in the states, and those were really effective on, on increasing diversion. And, and the uh, the residents, the community members, are really happy with with that type of uh, project. And so it it really is effective. Some of the other things we talked about the uh, integrated here waste management plan. I just you had the six items on here. I know Craig can speak a little bit about it, but I wanted to just do it. We definitely have an opportunity in education and outreach uh, for public awareness. The contract negotiations with WM are ongoing and, and it, it's in that this, um, discussion period right now with that. The household have this waste management opportunities, the HHW. Craig can add more to that, but we've added dates there to try to increase that. The trailer study to allow trailers at some of our bigger sites is ongoing. That hopefully that report will be done in a couple of months here. Let's have a draft report for some of our larger facilities and see what the outcome is there. The LCA is also ongoing. And I, I think that there's a, a, a response in there and Craig responded on that. And uh, the and again, work with Craig on the, the uh, EPR and and that stuff that works really, really well in, um, in proposing policies and ordinances to improve uh, source reduction and recycling. Again, there's a lot of opportunity to, to do the outreach with that. And then um, lastly, I, you asked about the ADF. I, I think that's a really good, the advanced disposal fee is a good program, but if we're looking to, in my opinion, a fun, uh, solid waste and, and as a, an attribute, we should be looking at the point of disposal type fees as well, whether it's bulk waste, it's, I heard it mentioned earlier, charging for some of the items that are typically free and, and, and usually at solid waste facilities, are, there's, a, there's a charge for that, a small fee, but it, it helps recover and uh, the processing fees for some of that. And, and as you saw for recycling, it's very expensive on the island to handle recycling. So to maybe recruit some of those fees would also be uh, a nice segue as well as with the advanced disposal program. I, I, I think it's a good program. I think it works well with uh, with the glass and there's opportunities. I don't think we go all in with it, but I think there's there's things that you can select it and, as we go through it and, and make it work for the island. That's all I have, but questions? Yeah. Well, just a comment, collecting the disposal fee at the point of purchase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. So, like, if you bring your uh, TV or whatever it is, that well, I mean, gonna... you're going to pay for it when you pick up the TV. Oh, you could do that too. Yeah. We know that where it's going to end up in eventually. Yes, right. Always in. So you get the money on the front end. You know, the front end of the cow is always a lot happier place to be than the back. That is, that is another. Uh, yeah, that you can do it that way too, as yeah. well as the front end, as well as the disposal. Yeah. yeah. I agree with you. Um, well, and that way you also know what's coming down the pipe. True. Sure. You get a heads up. Mm -hmm. I should let you know that I ha I have um, put in the request to Carol Wong 
uh, corporate counsel to talk about what the county's abilities are uh, to collect an advanced disposal fee on everything or selected things. Thank you very much. Um, also, uh, let you know that I'm going to be meeting after the EMC meeting with Mike yeah, and, and just do a little bit more conversation on, on where I've come from with the ISWMP and where he wants to go. Um, so hopefully we can have a, a more focused meeting um, uh, about these issues with him in November. So are there any other questions quick for Mike before he runs out the door? Don't see any. Happy meeting. No, it wasn't yeah. that. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always let them off easy. Is <laughs> that the yeah, first time? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. You never see it coming. All right. Right. <laughs> All right. So we were jumping around. I just want to make sure I go oh, back okay. to thank you. Um, our unfinished business five um, three on the the grant. Are there any last thoughts about that? We can close that item. Okay, seeing that. Sure, Jean, um, I had a actually a comment that I wanted to get on the record regarding Mike's um, one of his uh, recommendations, advanced disposal fee. Mm -hmm. um, I I wonder how the county would handle or or be able to get that fee for online purchases. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. I don't know if that's something we could roll into your analysis, Kira. I'll see what I can find. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I mean, any, anything that would come in hazmat, you know, with hazmat attached to it would be pretty easy to figure out, but there's an awful lot of stuff. A lot of loose ends there. Yep, a challenge. Um, okay, so going to item six. Uh, since we, I don't know who we have. Oh, we got Craig still. Is Chris still online? Can you see him? Georgie, this, this is Kira Wong. Just a reminder to uh, ask for public testimony throughout, if you're going to do it throughout for each number under Roman numeral six or all together at the, the beginning, just, I just want to remind you. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to see if we've got anybody who can talk about Roman numeral six uh, left online. I think we have a little bit. Um, so are, are there any uh, public testimony on any of the items under reports and correspondence? From attendees. Hearing none, going to move along. Um, the the uh, director's report uh, lists out a lot of stuff. We actually got a written director's report, so that was very nice to see. Um, I think one of the questions um, he's got it listed here as future items is to um, the, the review that's going on by the planning department on zoning and subdivision codes. Um, this, as I looked at their website is uh, at least a year, if not two effort to um, review and update the, the zoning uh, issues and there are some that are of interest to uh, our charter, uh, specifically getting people to sewer up as opposed to um, put in a crummy septic um, and uh, really need some input, I think, from DEM. I don't know if that's something you could cover, Brenda. Um, but the the issues around zoning get in the way of 
helping us to uh, build out our sewer system. We've got a lot of compact um, here in Kona, up, up the mountainside, we've got all these um, buildings that don't have connection to sewer and are required by code to connect to sewer because there's a 300 foot minimum uh, distance that you can do whatever you want to within that 300 feet. Um, so that may be one area where we would want to, to put together some comments. Oh, Ramsey, you're back. Good, talk about this because I'm blathering and not knowing exactly what I'm, I'm worried about. But I know one of the areas is on, on compost facilities and where we can site, can we just buy a little field next to a transfer station and allow that to be used for compost? No, that's zoning issues. So what are the zoning issues that we need to be aware of and develop some future comments to go into planning on? Definitely, thank you. I, I'm doing multitasking. Is I was listening to you guys, but I also have a deadline for other project I was working on. Sorry, but thank you, Brenda, for attending and becoming a lifesaver on the grant stuff. Hopefully, Brenda, she's my deputy director. She's my right hand, and I know she's she was very involved in the, with R and D. Um, discussion, securing, um, staffing, put out RFP. And my understanding, even the RFP that went out, nobody responded, uh, Rick. So I know it's easy to Google, but it's hard to deliver. So uh, two different things. And uh, the proof was in the budding. They put RFP out, they got zero response. So so that's the challenge we see on the island. So it's just, uh, it's going to continue. So um, as far as the code um, and zone changing, definitely I encourage you guys to participate. Uh, there was flyers that went out um, by the mayor's office, from the mayor's office to the west side and east side. They have to separate uh, public scoping meeting with the public uh, to go out around and, you know, uh, solicit information from the public. So I don't know how many, one of you guys had the chance to attend these um, these meetings and point out, you know, some concern issues or and what have you, but it was kind of unique. I went to the one on the West side and they really set it up nicely uh, you come in through the um, the building and they have these um, the posters and uh, about a year and a half of operation. There's somebody on the phone. Okay. So the idea was, yeah, they allowed the public to come in, read the posters, read, read some of the concern questions, answer it, put a red or green or yellow tap on what concerns you the most and so it was it was a kind of unique process that's how they're going to solicit information and they these information become policies so if you guys are concerned about policies and procedures moving forward i i encourage all of you guys to participate um, as a commissioners and also as a public uh Georgiana is right we have service areas within the Hilo facility and we have a service area within the Kalakehe Waste Treatment Facilities and some of the country plan facilities. When these initially were designed, they designed to provide services to a certain boundary within the community. And um, that boundary for us to be able to operate our facility in a more efficient way, we need to reach that capacity so we could be financially sustainable and treatment and process sustainable so we could have a better better flow comes in we could start doing more of the re resource recovery more of the r1 uh, volume because currently at the current situation we're in we at pretty much minimum kalake is only 1.28 million gallon um, it was designed for six mgd five to six so we only at 30 percent so we have not grown for the last 20 years. 
and that's true for Hilo. So it's it's very very important uh, the participation in the code. Like Georgiana said, the current code allows if you within 300 feet you have to connect. To me, if you're within the service area, you need to connect, uh, especially when you have a big development. But you know, and not for homes, but if if there is a big development, I think um, we need to be able to put synergy into working with these developers and maybe put some incentives to meet the goal of the mayor, which is affordable housing. That's our make major major. Um, goal that we're trying to achieve to make sure that there is affordable housing on this island. So we need to be able to partner and find creative solutions that could allow us to achieve that goal. So definitely it's it's a challenge. So you guys, um, you know, um, as, as the zone and subdivision codes are changing, we also going to work on changing our code as well, because part of that pretreatment process. So code change is going to be coming as well from our department. But um, yeah, uh, my advice to all of you as commissioners and public is um, participate. Well, one of the, the problems that I see I in us participating is just being aware of where the the barriers and the conflicts exist. I, one of the things I think I, I read about was that if you want to put a bunch of mini transfer stations, for example, scattered around Pune or within a development, um, there might even be state regulations that don't allow siting any kind of recycling or composting or the things the the top R's that we want to do with our waste, for example, um, because you can't by zoning requirement. Um, is that a real thing? Is that something that that we would want to try to influence um, the planning department about? Well, it's more of the Department of Health, if they allow it, the idea, do we, um, you know, um, are we going to allow every subdivision to have their own transfer station um, is going to be, uh, I highly don't recommend it. Um, we already have 22 transfer stations all over the island. So the idea is uh, you need to control it from the source. So uh, definitely. Uh, like Mike uh, and Christine, I think they they spoke earlier. The idea is if we could do more of public education, encourage people to do more of the diversion recycling at the source at their home, individual composting, home composting, and that will go quite a bit, uh, quite the distance. Um, if you know, because. Technically, your solid waste is part of your taxes at the current structure we have. So as you all know, we get certain percentage to cover our department costs for the solid waste. That's equivalent to about four to plus or minus 4% of the entire general fund that comes to our department to cover the solid waste. That, that taxes, laws and rules was probably a, before even diversion or recycling was an option back then. But you're right, we're not getting enough to do all the services and we need to find ways within our means and, um, you know, staff is right and prior testimony is right. We need to chase grant, we need to get whatever money we can to continue promoting these programs. They're very important to the island, very important to us from an environmental point of view. So we need to expand and we need to find ways to be able to uh, either generate revenues um, or get more of the general fund or do it a, um, 
you know, I know there was discussion about bay as you throw, but what is that due to the current tax revenue that we're getting because you cannot double charge? It's complicated issue. I think it's it's a law issue. I'll leave it to the attorneys to figure it out, but it's it's uh, it's very complex. Um, do you do enterprise fund? Do you do land use fee fund? I mean, it's it's it gets very complicated, but for what we got now, we need to function within the means that we have, which is about four plus percent that comes to the division to do their business. And that includes everything that Mike talked about. When you see a $5,000 per ton for hazard waste, and when you see $116 per ton for landfill, it's it's a huge $5,000 per ton comes out of the taxpayer's money from that 4%. So sometimes we have to do the right business decision, but yeah, we need to be able to promote everything possible. So um, uh, it's a challenge. We need to do more of the public education. We need to do definitely diversion and, and recycling at the source. We need to educate the public, you know, um, even with that home composting, like I was saying earlier. So we have a lot of homework to do. I'm glad that Mike on, on board now with us and working with the community and securing grants and moving forward. Um, hopefully we can start checking the boxes as we move forward. So as far as subdivisions, um, you know, from a zoning point of view, they're gonna look at how, what type of mitigative uh, measures they're gonna provide, how how it's gonna impact our current infrastructure. And these, most of these transfer stations that were, you know, built at least 30 some years ago, some are new. So when we build them, the population was not as at the same rate as we see it now. So definitely the demand is going to go high up on these transfer stations. And we only have one landfill for the whole island. So um, that's that's going to be a challenge as, as we do more of the development, how we're going to handle the waste and how we're going to um, control that as well. But we need to start building the foundation now to be able to... Um, to have a better management of what we have now. Otherwise, um, you know, that that sand hole is going to continue digging deeper and deeper and it's hard to come out of it. So, um, yeah, um, one thing we could do, I keep saying when I first started, we could do a Europe model. I mean, literally at each corner, they have these three bins, a recyclable uh, four cubic yard bin, um, cardboard and waste. So people, as they leave in their subdivision, they just carry their bag and put it there and the county or the city goes and picks it up. And they well, that, do more that was that what I person. meant by these mini transfer stations to, to put a recycle collections point in a subdivision or uh, on every other corner. So to make it easy um, for people to, to find a place to put their recyclables. Mm -hmm. um, but can you... Is that possible with zoning? I don't know. Uh, Melissa? I, I guess if they change it, if they, um, the challenge, I had a discussion when I first started with planning and other directors, is, is could we allow these subdivision to come in and do what apartment complexes do? Your apartment complexes, they get these garbage containers within enclosed area, 20 by 10 feet. And the you know the garbage truck comes in and picks up the cardboard you have a recyclable you have waste and what have you and could a subdivision do that um the challenge with a subdivision you have to create some home association to have a to go and collect the fees and to be able to pay for the service because when when you have a subdivision each home individually on their own an apartment complex um vertically it goes part of the apartment management that collect the fees and process the service. So maybe a model like that, we talked about it, um, you know, 
way back then maybe, but yeah, we need to think outside the box. How could we influence the zone change by allowing the developers to allow area to be able to maintain that and to be order control free because um, definitely you're gonna have the order, you're gonna have, um, the site is not gonna be that pretty in a subdivision. When it, so it has to be isolated, it has to be uh, architecturally designed to prevent vectors, uh, cats and other animals coming in uh, to that area. So do people want it in their subdivision? You're probably gonna see objection because it's gonna be an eyesore. Okay. Um, moving along on the- uh, I think Melissa had her- I, I did, Oh, Melissa, yeah, had, yeah, go, sorry. I had a couple of questions. Um, so I, I think that's a great idea, having bins and transfer, or um, these sorts of uh, you know places and subdivisions. But I, um, I was wondering, Oh my gosh, the thought just flew out of my head. <laughs> oh, oh, right. Okay. So, um, so my, my one concern is, as, as we kind of all know, like my concern is that, is that people are not necessarily going to be educated to know that they need to put clean things, for example, into the recycling, like clean their glass, clean their cans, clean their, so then I, I wonder part of this process, you know, do, would we have the staffing to then, and also people might not put things in the proper places, right? Because we all know how, how this works. Um, so then it's like, do we have the staffing that to sort items that aren't necessarily in the proper bins? And then that goes, ties back into education. It's the way I see it, it's all connected, right? So the education piece is incredibly important with this because people need to be educated to know that they have to clean their they have to clean their stuff and they have to put it in the proper bins. And then my other question was about the zoning. Um, so I guess who who determines the zoning and and who who do we ask, you know, uh, these questions about the zoning? Like is it possible to put these mini sort stations in, say, HPP or in whatever subdivision. Because um, Ramsey, you had mentioned Department of Health, but I don't think it's Department of Health that determines the zoning, right? So who who's determining? No, the zoning is your planning department, but the Department of Health is going to either permit it or not permit it. Because anytime you refer to it as a transfer station, it has to have an attendance. Somebody had to be attended. So that falls in the Department of Health. So we need to be careful because now it become, instead of having a 22 transfer station, we're gonna have a hundred transfer station that manned by county employees because you cannot just decide about these mini transfer station or, and say, well, we're not gonna ban them. That's why I'm thinking we could use more of the Europe model or the apartment complex models where you just put up four cubic yard bins at each corner and you know you go pick them up uh, rather than call it many transfer station because that falls under department of health and you open in a can of warm for regulatory compliance as well it seems like it'd be more of a sorting station right like it's not a transfer station it's a sorting station but even sorting is it has to be um a fall under uh the mandate of department of health because even with sorted, and you know, that's we call it mini MIRF material recovery plan. All that requires certain certain things you have to follow from health and safety, unless it comes really clean. Like you said, it's you know, it goes back in a cycle. You know, you, you never know what you're going to be handling in your hand. <laughs> right. Yep, that's right. Okay, thank you. Now back to the challenge of collection. That we we have very limited collection of anything, trash, much less recyclables. Um, and again, that's that's a major infrastructure and business friendliness that uh, is lacking on this island. Well, uh, I mean, John, if I may. Yeah. Now you've given us the good news. Now I'll give you the bad news. Let's see. What I know the most about is Puna. Um, 
we have large parcels of land that are in, a, for instance, the area that was just paved over down around Poiki. Um, those were 10 acre parcels, but they're in Ag 1. The owners of those lots have the right to subdivide those into one acre parcels. They bought that, they own it. Um, my 80,000 TMKs in the Pune district is probably the good news because if you look at the numbers of lots that are parcels that have not been taken to their least common or to their greatest common denominator, had the most subdivide division done that they are legally entitled to. So we don't have roads, we don't have water, and we don't have waste handling systems from front to back, top to bottom. And every one of them are legally entitled to these services. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I won't be here to see it, but somebody's gonna end up owning it. I think this is a really important point, John, and I really I appreciate you always kind of coming circling back around to this because John and I were both in Pune and we're seeing an, a, a population explosion. <laughs> I mean, I drive to Hilo for work and I can't it, the amount of traffic that has just exponentially increased over even the last five years is massive. And so I think this is really important, you know, because we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about sewage, we're talking about water, all these things. And John's right, you know, there are people that are subdividing properties left and right. And where, how are we going to provide these services to these people? And like he said, you know, there, these, these properties, these huge properties can be subdivided into one acre parcels. I mean, I'm seeing it right down the road from my place. I'm seeing it all over the place down here in Lower Puna. And this is going to be a huge problem, you know, not in the not too far uh, future. So I think it's it's really important to, yeah, I don't know, keep this in mind when talking about all these things. I, maybe one um, direction change we could make is is to move off of solid waste and go to uh, item six one three. Four, <laughs> which is the wastewater plans. And Puna is, oh, I forgot is one. So it's six, three, four, one. Puna wastewater manage, master plan, go. Let me to start, Ramsey? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Jill. <laughs> it's Kelly Hartman, who's the project manager, planner. What's your title? <laughs> I'm the environmental management planner. There you go. But I am the project coordinator on this specific project. Um, one moment, let me scroll down. Okay, so for the Puna project, DEM's evaluating the feasibility and the potential locations for the addition of wastewater services and the facilities. Um, we're preparing a programmatic environmental impact statement and facility plan. We held our public scoping meeting um, October 12th. It's being broadcasted currently on the Leo TV this um, currently and, and through the weekend. So you might want to check that out. Um, we have a, a website for this project. And so um, you can go there and link to the video as well. Uh, we had a second public Zoom meeting Thursday, um, October 20th, and that is also posted to the website. The public comment period did end October 24th, um, but if you have further comments, um, my email and contact information is all over the website and documents, um, so feel free to reach out. Um, we're continuing right now to gather information for the programmatic environmental impact statement. We're doing technical studies like the cultural impact assessment and the archaeological literature review. Uh, we've held separate meetings with the planning department 
Um, we're trying to drum up interest from the Puna Community Development Plan Group um, and the Chamber of Commerce to distribute some of our information. Draft review for the EIS um, for the county is going to come in January, beginning of January, and it'll be filed March 6, 2023. The draft uh, facility plan, where, like I said, we're continuing to gather information um, that should be submitted for the county's review in February. Um, the final EIS is scheduled for September of 2023. And we have a, um, a facility plan work, uh, workshop scheduled um, November 7th um, with DEM and the consultants. So did you get any a lot of participation in the 24th meeting? So the 24th meeting we did, it was bigger than the in-person meeting at KL High School. I think we had four people at KL High School and 12 people on the Zoom meeting. Mm. Did you participate, John? No. It's but not I'm... that many people. It's not that many <laughs> I didn't know people. about this meeting. How are you um, advertising this meeting? I mean, the problem is that that, that as far as Puna is concerned, did, did you ever look up the Puna CDP that has my name on it? Yep, yep. So we've reached out to that group multiple times. Yeah, and and it, it has it has all the gory details. And in other words, the build out scenarios. Yep. Um, it's a nightmare, <laughs> to put it politely. Um, there isn't the roads, there isn't the water, there isn't the schools, there isn't the hospitals. I mean, the list is just endless. I'm not going to be here to see it, but somebody's going to own it. Okay, Melissa, you're on. I mean, John's right. I yeah, I've already we've we've we could we could beat this horse. The horse is dead, but it, he's right. I mean, we just. <laughs> They're really lacking in infrastructure. I mean, it can't be said enough times, you know, it just, and the development's out of control. And I don't know how we get a handle on the development because it's it's development without the infrastructure. So it's development without the roads, without the water, without the sewer, without the health services, without, I mean, like John said, the list goes on and on and on. Well, is and, that back to the planning department? Yeah. And zoning and saying quit. I think so. quit the zoning. Well, no, it's already yes no, yeah it's, it's a done deed i mean like, what we really got to gotta be working on is how is how we buy it back i mean i think one thing that we, we get when we get an ocean view which which they will ocean view community has a large volume of people living there however they pay a very low rate for their taxes because you know their properties are very inexpensive and that's why people gravitate toward Puna and Kiao because of properties, you can get a beautiful house in Kiao for a very reasonable price where you would not be able to get that same house in Hilo or Kona because they do pay the higher premium because they are next to the infrastructure. So it might be a catch 22. You may have to pay more for your properties if you want the infrastructure brought to you. <clears throat> well, I mean, I, yeah, it, 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 we, you know, we went over this and over and over looking for ways to manage it. You know, I mean, not only do you, you're producing a document that goes into the future and it is intended to be a management document. And you just keep looking at it and you go, how are you going to manage this? How are you going to make this livable, survivable? And it, it is uh, uh, without buy-in from, you know, well, the state had a hand in this. And they seem to have managed to, to keep an arm's distance from it because they allowed it to begin. I think so, the issue is, oh, sorry, John. No, go ahead. I think the issue is development, you know? I mean, 
I, I'm going to say it. Le Leilani should never have existed, right? Leilani <laughs> subdivision was built on the East Rift Zone, Lava Zone 1. So we have a huge issue. We have a huge development problem here in Lower Puna. And I don't know how we get a handle on the development because it, it has to do with money, right? People want to make money and there's developers that come in and subdivide these huge pieces of land and make half acre lots. And then people want access to all these services that don't exist. They just simply don't exist. And so this is the, to me, this is the core of the problem is the, is the development and the, and cheap land and people wanting to live in paradise. And I mean, this is a huge topic and I don't even know if it's, you know, appropriate here, but um, I do think that it's the core of the problem. Well, it, it is our challenge of, as this commission, what can we do about it? I think one part of it is we're talking about the wastewater treatment planning process. And I am overjoyed that Kelly is on board to help do that. Um, I would say that I personally, I think Rick did too. We looked at the preliminary uh, outline of things that AECOM is putting together against the uh, components of master wastewater management plan. And I was pleased to see that, yep, they're, they're including things that we had on the list. I think they're heading in the right directions. It's still way 30,000 foot level. So, you know, the, the, the work is all gonna be in the detail as we work down. But from that standpoint, I think DEM is tackling it as well as they can with what they've got to deal with. Um, and maybe what we need to look at, and not only make sure they are, are doing the comprehensive review, but is there something that we need to make a pitch saying, here we are this relatively narrow chartered commission to the <laughs> mayor and to the council um, to, you know, time out. We, we cannot play catch up. We're gonna try, we, but every time we try to put something in place, the development explodes and we're already falling further and further behind. Um, and there are things that we as a commission or DEM cannot control. Uh, it needs to come from another direction uh, at, a, at a higher planning um, position. And maybe again, it's, it's a public education effort of you cannot move into a house and build a house that has no way to manage its waste because you can't live without generating, I'm sorry, zero waste people. <laughs> you can't live without generating some waste. So don't <laughs> until we get oh, that's the infrastructure. Yeah. You can. Yeah. <laughs> Any rate, I've got a request for a, a health break uh, to be able to, to go off. So go to your... your um, Go to your corner. Places of privacy <laughs> and think, all right, what the heck is EMC going to be able to do about this yeah. major crisis? And we'll probably need to deal with it next meeting and get it on the agenda and try to figure out how to get our arms around. What could we do? So maybe I just say one quick thing, Georgine, maybe for that next meeting, we need someone from the planning department because it seems like a planning department issue with the zoning. Could be, could be if, all right, I saw thumbs up, <laughs> Brenda. All right, we'll try to do well, that. Another recommendation, maybe you guys need to start attending the planning commission meetings. <laughs> <That's what we laughs> <need. I'm Andy. laughs> right? <laughs> Don't bring everybody to DA, oh, yeah. go to their commission meeting. <laughs> they can do. Well, we don't know that unless we go to the meeting. Never give up, John. Exactly. Never give up. <laughs> okay, but we are going to give up this meeting for <laughs> 10 minutes <laughs> so everybody can... When you bought the land. Get real. Uh, so 1045, be back here. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we're back online and I had didn't, didn't get... Lee McIntosh's hand uh, address. So Lee, did you have a comment? 
And then I'll yeah, ask I... everybody for their brilliant <clears throat> ideas that they discovered during the break. <laughs> This is Commissioner McIntosh. I was just going to say the state constitution guarantees each person to build a house on their property. So there's really nothing the county can do to prevent that. However, there is a program where they're buying land, you know, in Puna from individuals and taking it out of circulation. They have that option, which is costly. And it also takes those takes away property taxes from the county, so it hurts their coffers for revenue. Um, but I mean, it was all created in the 70s. And so it's just something the county has to deal and work with. Mm -hmm. So get used to it. This is our future. Well, that wasn't a happy note. <laughs> Jeez, <Lee. laughs> Anybody have a better idea? One, one that got mentioned uh, here was that uh, maybe we should look at the Army Corps of Engineers. And did Brenda come back online or did she run away? And as I understand, part of Brenda's job is to go find money. Uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers has money. Lots of money. Um, and they're really good at spending lots of money. Um, anyway, we will, I will explore with um DEM maybe some opportunities to to look at the Army Corps as another um source of solutions. <laughs> if there be such a thing. I'll also uh look into um talking to the planning department. But did anybody else have, have a brilliant brainstorm they'd like to share with us? Ooh. Rick Gaffney has Oh, there it is in the tree, in the tree. <laughs> Rick Gaffney. Um, not a brilliant idea necessarily, just a, a follow up to your pursuit of the Army Corps of Engineers. One of the largest federal um, fund sources is the Farm Bill. Um, it's literally hundreds of billions of dollars. And um, that is definitely a source for, because it, essentially the island is entirely rural. Um, and uh, the Farm Bill generally includes uh, things like waste management, recycling, um, wastewater management, wastewater reuse. So, um, it's something, uh, and, and the other thing is that uh, if, if, if Brenda's job is, is pursuing money, then one of the most valuable things she can do is, um, it, and, and maybe she's already done this, and that's create a, a personal relationship with staff at um, our two Congress people's office and our uh, two senators' offices. Um, I have been in Washington in these offices and had staff people say to me, I don't understand why there is so much federal money available that Hawaii doesn't pursue. It, mm -hmm. it frustrates them endlessly because they regularly create lists of money that's becoming available and they don't see it being pursued. So again, close communications with the offices um, and in particular, Senator Schatz's office, because um, he sits on, on ways and means. Um, and I, I would further add that now that it's clear that Jill Tokuda is going to be our second congressional representative, um, she has very strong legislative skills and probably will be a very valuable asset to the county as well. Good idea. Elise Robinson. You know, I just noticed that Brenda stepped off. I had a question for her if any of the money, um, the American Rescue Plan Act, if any of those monies were designated for DEM. Don't know. We'll ask. Part of the problem, at least my perception, is that somebody, just like we were talking about for the ZPA recycling grant, there has to be somebody's 
in DEM who know what they're asking the money for. Yeah, that's the truth. And what they're going to do with the money. And that whole planet is what Kelly's going to do. Kelly's going to at least help with the, the wastewater management, right? Well, we have plenty of projects on deck that need to get funded. We have a list of CIP projects that get submitted and prioritized every year. And so, you know, not being too involved with the financial side, that would be the first place I would start um, because that all gets run through, you know, the Department of Health um, and the EPA, and they're going to get more involved in the future. And so those are the projects that we need to be focused on. Okay. And just to add then, to this, Georgie, um, just make sure you guys understand, we try to play catch up. Uh, we have not done any maintenance on some of these facilities for years. Mm -hmm. so, literally, most of our project is just to get us back where we need to be. And that's taken the bulk of um, our time, the funding time and money. And so, um yeah we the funding is so limited because of um just the amount of projects that we have well and and i apologize you do have the cip list where you have prioritized projects right. on the wastewater side um not so much on the solid waste side as i recall no we have a few um we have few on the solid waste as well. And as you guys recall, when we went and asked for the GO bond, there was $3 million set aside to, uh, to work on the solid waste facility improvement. So, um, and we are replacing the Hilo, working on the Hilo reload scale. So definitely some of the money and there's some capital projects are listed uh, within the CIB. Are any of those candidates for this recycling grant? Well, uh, some, some, some of them are just like um, the scale. I don't know if it could be um, because it goes back to we're trying to catch up. We cannot. Yeah. You have to fix it. So you, you cannot wait to run it through a grant process. It may take two years or so and right. to secure. It. So, but the ones that um, we could afford the time, you're right. The grant is the way to go after. Okay. Um, for Peter's sir's sake, we need to get back on track on the um, <laughs> agenda. Um, so we were going at, at the bottom of item three on the wastewater division projects update. Um, you had included in your director's report um, a presentation about Pahala and Nahalehu um, cesspool closures. I don't need you, I think, to, to read through it all, but whether there were some highlights from um, the meetings you've had and follow up. I can take that, Ramsey, if you like. Sure, definitely. Go for it. All right. So, DM has recently submitted to EPA its feasibility evaluation report to identify the legal and technical feasibility of four potential wastewater treatment project options to replace the large capacity cesspools. Uh, the feasibility report was submitted before the AOC deadline. Um, I can go through the options, or maybe I'll wait if you have questions. Um, the, the EPA will review and approve the report, and then once we get that approval, all of the AOC deadlines basically cascade off of that approval date. Um, our contract with Brown and Caldwell has been executed to do are for Pahala. They're prepping to do some percolation tests. Uh, we also had our quarterly October meeting with EPA. Um, they're very happy with our schedule and our automated reporting system for the AOC. 
Uh, we had a successful public meeting in August. Brenda did a great job on that. Um, and we have a we also created a website that's posted on um, the county's website that you can get to. So you should check that out. And that's that's just a summary update of, of that project. Okay. I it sounds like it's moving along. I am I'm really impressed at the um, the outreach and the putting information available on the website. Um, it's it's a nice uh, change in uh, making sure that communication happens. Um, I had a question and maybe you addressed it last time, so I apologize, Ramsey. Um, relative to what individual homeowners can do, and they can, uh, do you have a feel for how many are likely to be dealing with the individual wastewater systems versus hooking up to package operations or or larger uh, feelings? Did did you have any sense of what the split might be? Well, we um, we finalized the first um, step in the process, which is the feasibility study, and it was submitted to EPA within the time limit as per AOC. And it seemed like it's definitely feasible for that process to move forward. The second step we are jumping into is the preliminary engineering report and analysis. So we're going to go and do some soil sampling to, to figure out the percolation rates for certain areas and do that so we get a better idea of, of what we're dealing with, but eventually uh, we cannot redetermine. So we have to go through the process. So you're asking me to be pre redetermined yeah. something <laughs> that- crystal ball. I'm, I just... <laughs> you, so I'm not gonna answer your question. <laughs> okay, I got it, I got it. That's all right. All right, West Hawaii. You know, are any other questions uh, about the AOC activities? This is Commissioner McIntosh. Uh, when do you think those, um, I guess your engineering study will be done, you'll know what you're going to do? We, we had the kickoff. I think we have under the AOC, uh, Kelly, you may want to remind me, I think we have 180 days to complete, if I remember that correctly. Correct. So that's for Pahala. We have 180 Pahala, yeah after we get approval for Nalehu, it's something closer to 300, maybe 365 days after yeah. the approval. Wow. So we have it, we're not gonna wait to that 300, but hopefully the consultants start working on it. So uh, the sooner we put all that information together, the better uh, information we could convey here at these meetings. Any issues with the earthquake? Um, you know, that's a, I mean, that's part, you know, that is gonna be considered as yeah, you guys know from um, eruption to earthquake, as we get into the design recommendation, all that's gonna be considered as a factor as, um, you know, uh, as we go through the option selection, so. Yeah, I mean, anything that could impact whatever we're going to design moving forward is going to be considered. But remember, earthquake is nothing new. So, I mean, we know we're dealing with uh, earthquake eruptions and what have you. So, okay, moving on to West Hawaii. What's up there? So Kelly, you want to give an update on your some of your master plan and project mastering? And sure. I'm so glad just to tell you guys, I'm so glad to have Kelly on board. Georgiana, you said it. You thought you were glad. I'm I'm hundred times over. She's really uh, a star. Thank Great. you. Um, okay, so for we've got the master plan and we've got the master schedule. Um, so I like to 
make sure we're talking about the, the right thing. So we talked, we were talking about creating a contract for the wastewater master plan. So a countywide wastewater master plan. Um, and the goal of that is to take all of these regional plans that we're currently working on, putting them together, make sure they make sense. Um, and so we have updated you know, facility plans all around. Um, I submitted a draft scope of work to develop that contract um, to our, to Eric Takamura. Um, so I'm waiting on a final scope of work from him. Um, we, that has to go through our, you know, our budget process, which we're currently in right now. And so we'll see if that's a contract that we can pick up next year. Um, and as far as the master schedule, um, what I'm doing right now is collecting all the project schedules for every wastewater project in the county from the individual project lead project coordinators. Uh, we got them all uh, Microsoft project software licenses and training um, and support. Um, so they're supposed to build out those schedules um, submit them to me in one common location. And what I'm going to be doing is kind of cleaning up the data. Um, and then it's all going to get sucked into one master project schedule. Um, and so that way we can see, you know, it'll be uh, automated reports again um, and a Gantt chart. So we can really drill down into the nitty gritty details of deadlines when we need to, but then also look at it from the bird's eye view of, you know, what do we have going on in the next six months, the next year, the next five years. That's, that's my goal. Sounds fantastic. Um. Any other questions for DEM from commissioners? Okay. Um, I think, oh, one question. Again, I'm sorry, Peter, jumping around here that I, I, um, wanted to cover and it may even have been up in the legislative update area i should have said um whether uh chris is on the call or any new updates related to the electronic waste i understand that the companies are supposed to be coming up with their plans and they're they got an extension to come up with how they're going to pay for or coordinate the collection of, of e-waste uh, <clears throat> that is covered by the new law. And the DOH has got some work to do as well. Um, is DEM happy with the way things are going? Getting geared up to handle it? I don't know. Greg, do you have any updates on that? But um, yeah, whatever comes through the state, we're going to continue working with them. Uh, in addition, as you all know, we we package together a uh, contract with the ideas for our e-waste and trying to do it probably X number of events per year. So, and that's how we're going to bid the the contract where we could allow events like similar to the hazardous waste events, but it's going to be um, now also electronic uh, waste events within the island. So, um, and that's what we try to achieve um, for that program. Um, is there any addition information? Greg, you might want to add or not so much as far as for the state but um chris did say that he is um still speaking with the um i guess the loan bidder 
and they're clarifying things right now. And they're hoping to get um, events started again. Yet this year? Yeah, this year. Great. Well, we're going to try to see if we could. Um, it depends on the bidding and the notice award um, to the contractor. But yeah, the the state funds, it kicked in. So we have, um, we have till June 30th for that fiscal year to be able to um, spend some of that money. So we need to figure out, we need to work with the potential uh, vendor to see how many events we could do in this short time of, uh, you know, because by the time we probably issue notice to proceed, we're gonna have about six months. So, and we really planned it for the whole year event but because we lost about six months trying to coordinate and trying to put the RFP in the contract. So um, the question is, should we double the amount of event to maximize it or have the money carry over? So there's some logistics that we're working on, but definitely um, this, the minute that contract get awarded, uh, we'll start the events to get that thing going. Great. Um, any other random questions, comments? Seeing none, um, to uh, item seven, future agenda items. Um, I will uh, look into whether we can bring in. Sorry, did we? What? Did we? No, Rick, you got to be on top of this stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, Rick Gaffney had wanted to ask about, uh, oh, he did address it in the director's report, if you wanted more on um, water quality advisories coming from DOH. Um, we had a, a bit of a, a hiccup one that turned into a never mind. Um, but if you wanted to get some more information on that, Rick. Um, I, I, I'm okay with the with the response that Ramsey put in the director's report, but uh, I'm continually frustrated by um, the what seems like a disconnect between DOH's actions uh, with regard to reporting these wastewater incidents and um, whether or not they actually mean anything. Um, you know, my understanding is that they they have to do this um, and they're also they're funded to do it by the federal government um, but the truth is that what they're reporting is something we already know and that is that these types of bacteria live in our near shore waters a hundred percent of the time and the university of Waihilo has um, confirmed that in in a recent study that says that these bacteria also live in every other water source on the island, all the rivers, all the ponds, all the streams, um, and so forth. So, you know, we get these reports and, and uh, DOH's timing couldn't have been worse. I mean, the day before Ironman, um, they say that the, the beach at the Ironman start is um, out, over the limit. Um, and I mean, that's just wrong from so many points of view. And then all of a sudden it goes away. Um, is that a political decision? Is that what? Um, and then the next day they're saying that um, that Kua Bay, which is pristine and probably has no sources of, of um, wastewater input um, is like 200 times over the legal limit. And of course that goes away the next day too. And there never seems to be any uh, recognition of the fact that any high water event, king tides, high surf, um, high wind incidences that push the water further inland uh, are going to cause these kinds of reports. So it just, <laughs> it's a, I'm sure it's a frustration for Ramsey as well, because they're spending all this time doing something that's useless. And they seem to be spending that time doing something that's useless because 
the federal government, the EPA, essentially requires them to do it and pays them to do it. So it's, it's a ridiculous situation. And so I've just said that it's on the record. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything we can do short of going to our congressional representatives and saying, why do you continue to do this? Because it must be equally frustrating to people who care in South Florida and South Carolina and you know Southern California and every other place where these issues are regularly reported and are essentially meaningless. So I've had my rant. <laughs> thank, thank you, Rick. I guess the, the pertinent question for us as EMC advising DEM, is there some way to reduce the burden on you guys to, to go through the little exercise of running and verifying that, nope, there's still no pipe dumping stuff into the water. Um, yeah, usually these samples, um, we don't get into the water in the United States, the beaches and the ocean water, because that's that's a state and federal. So we don't do any sampling. And we, we hear it through Department of Health, similar to what Rick was saying. Mm -hmm. They post it on their website. They don't even notify us. Right. So our guys, our compliance staff, sometimes when we hear something, then we start researching it or calling DOH and trying to narrow down, um, you know, what's going on. And we call our collection system and and compliance people and tell them. You know what's going on. We've seen the report similar to what Rick was when he forwarded to us that report. Um, you know, our guys went out there um, even prior to the Ironman starting. Our guys went there. They spent about two weeks making sure we, as you all know, we finished the CIPP lining the entire road sewer line to make sure that we don't have any mishaps. Our guys went. They actually double maintained, uh, greased, oiled, all these pumps within the force main pump station along LAE Drive to make sure that the extra amount of participants for these for that one week event does not create any sewer backup or sewer backflow. It was a success. Our guys did their, their best to um, maintain that line prior to the event. So when we saw that DOH report, we were stuck as as well as Rick and everybody else. Did. Um, and we tried to chase it down and and they took it down. And but we know our system was ready for that event because our guys put a lot of work on lining that sewer line and finish it before that event. And you know, I secured all the pump station along LA Drive. So yeah, um, sometimes we do chase our tails when we get reports like that, that because we're gonna stop doing everything we're doing, trying to chase down, you know, the Department of Health or other reports that are posted, but they don't tell us where they took the sample, when, at what time they took the sample. So there's no coordination in that. Can so you request have, it or should we request it? Well, we do once it, it get posted on their website, but not before. So that, that seems a peculiar way to let you know. Um, yeah. D, you but our, our staff are instructed and directed to continue reaching out to Department of Health. Uh, you know, it's all about transparency, right? So. Dee Fulton has comment. Yeah, thank you, Georgine. Um, I know that there was speculation that the higher than normal reading of intracaucus prior to Ironman could have been related to sand being stirred up by the number of people entering and exiting that small sandy entry that's down there at the pier. So there was speculation about that. That seems reasonable as Intracaucus does reside in the sand. Um, I have no idea what was going on at Kua that we had a high reading there. But I do wanna qualify what my friend, colleague Rick Gaffney said, and that 
yes, we can get intracaucus elevated readings when we have weather events, when we have rains that are washing things down, when we have high winds, when we have high tides that are potentially reaching into cesspits and groundwater and raising the level of intracaucus from those sources. That said, there could be, I don't want people to totally, totally write off intracaucus, although we sure need a better indicator for our climate. Um, it's not completely meaningless if you consider that if we have an event where there is no weather event and we have elevated intracaucus. Granted, that's rare these days, but if you get an elevated intracaucus in the absence of a weather event, then you must consider that there could be some sewage involved. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, what else did I miss, Peter? Um, Hilo is our dreams. Hilo? Everything's going swimmingly. No, don't swim in Hilo. What? No, Hilo actually is doing well. Um, we're supposed to get the 90% design in December. So everything is moving according to schedule and within budget. So, hey, good to hear. Okay, we ready to move to future agenda items? Is there anything anyone knows now that they want me to? Put on the list. Get Puoco if you'd like a quick update on Puoco. Oh, sure. Put Puoco for, mm. for next time or for right now. I can just run through it real quick. It, there's not much going on. It's it's one of our further out projects. So we're preparing a wastewater master plan um, for wastewater services in the Puoco and South Pahala regional area. And uh, the project recommendations will include County of Hawaii sanitary sewer system through a 30 year planning period, including collection, treatment, and disposal. We had our, our project kickoff meeting. The consultant is not coming out to do their first site visit until May. And then we have the draft project um, definition report. Um, that will include a study of the area, wastewater infrastructure options, and that is not actually due in its final form until July 2023. Okay, next year. We'll bring it up. Rick, oh, it looks like a flower in your tree in your background. Yes, <laughs> Rick. Sorry, I, I, I don't know how to move that anywhere else, so I'd put it on the top of my head. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there is a there's something that I, I think that the commission needs to revisit um, that was uh, seriously considered years ago, and I haven't heard any discussion of it lately, and that is the, um, the removal of the old Kealakehe dump. Um, for mm -hmm. those of you that are familiar, um, it's, it's an unlined uh, solid waste disposal site. Um, and it's been on fire off and on, if not continuously for many, many years. Um, when the fire gets out of control, um, a lot of water is consumed uh, trying to put it out. Um, and uh, actually other chemicals have to be used because there are other things burning in it. Uh, it becomes a real problem because the buildings nearby house the police department and the um, animal shelter and they have to be uh, evacuated um, when the smoke gets bad. So it's a festering um, problem that we've known about for a really long time. And there's been various discussion over time about how to deal with it. But I, I think that it's, it's been largely forgotten. I, I may be wrong about that, but bottom line is it needs to be, um, it, it needs to be, uh, repatriated, I don't know what the word is, is um, it needs to be uh, dealt with um, because it's going to be a long-term problem for this community. And um, it's also, it's in a location that could be far better used for other purposes. 
um, like the regional park, which has been talked about for the area forever. Um, so I just want that to be. Okay, well, let's put it on, on next time's meeting so that DEM could do some research on it and then we could um, talk about it. Just, just something to keep in mind, uh, Rick and Georgiana. Um, you're talking about clean closures. That landfill, if you're gonna clean closure, uh, do clean closure activities, you need to have another landfill to take the waste to. And we only have one landfill for the whole island. So you're gonna reach capacity of the current landfill. So that option, just to let you know, it's probably not gonna fly. Just because, um, unfortunately, we only got about 20 years, 15 to 20 years remaining on the current landfill. So you could eat up that capacity quickly if you're thinking about a clean closure. So, um, but I agree with you, the, the current landfill, um, uh, it's not lined, it's burning from the inside out. Uh, we have to deal with fires in and out. So it's a challenge for maintenance. It's a, unfortunate. We cannot extract the gas. It's like mm -hmm. an explosion waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it's a scary thought. Um, but yeah, trying to do a clean closure um, and only one landfill on the island is going to be, is, yeah, you can, we're going to run out of space. I mean, so we need to just continue having it in mind and figure ways maybe if we could capture the gas. And we did talk to sustainability partners to see if they could tap into the gas uh, resource and extract the gas from the landfill. The challenge with that, because it's not confined, is not um, lined. So the likelihood you may introduce oxygen as you do in the vacuum, and that could also exacerbate the fire and the explosion to the side. So it's a challenging um, situation, and uh, we're going to continue doing the monitoring until we figure out what we're going to do with our landfills is just uh, one landfill for the whole island is not sustainable. Um, I, I think, I don't know if Kira is giving me dirty eye, but uh, it's not on the agenda. So next time, I think we could okay. talk about it. Um, and your comment that you made that our current landfill only has 20 years left. Every time I hear it talked about, it has fewer and fewer years left. <laughs> so maybe that's an item that we need to have on next time's agenda as well. Because um, there are solutions that can uh, you know, deal with that issue too. Uh, any other, and for some reason, Peter, I'm, I'm blanking. We were gonna talk about having a, a tracking system for things that we've recommended November. in November. Um, so we we have kind of a template and I need to do some more homework to fill in some of the blanks, um, but to see how do we make sure we don't just let things lay in a unlined landfill of memory uh, for recommendations that we've made in the past. D, you had an idea, comment, unmute. 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 There you go. Uh, I, I wanted to pick up and amplify um, what Ramsey had suggested, which I thought was a great suggestion, in that uh, that we go to a planning commission meeting. Now, with sunshine laws, if we were to go together, I mean, would would that be? I mean, a few of us. Let's see, we got three of us together to go. Would that be violating any sunshine laws? So you would need to be go, you would need to go in your capacity as an individual member of the public. Um, those planning commission meetings are not designed to address business of this commission, so that's fine. Um, but you but you still would not be able to discuss or um, yeah, discuss amongst yourselves how or in what way you want to take action on something. But it's kind of hard because the Leeward Planning Commission's uh, duties and authorities, 
I want to say are have nothing to do with this commission, so it should be fine. Um, but you, it wouldn't be like a joint meeting where EMC commissioners meet with the landing, uh, uh, leeward planning commission or windward planning commissioners. It would be you attending the meeting as a member of the public. And I posted the link in the chat. Um, you can you can click on that link and then see the calendar, the county calendar for those meetings. Um, the Windward Planning Commission meets once a month, and so does the Leeward Planning Commission. And then you can see all of their agenda items. Okay, is that good, D? Uh, well, I haven't attended one of those meetings before. Is there a, a time for public testimony before the? What in what capacity would an with for me acting as an individual? be able to present information at planning committee meetings. So you, it, the planning commission meetings are all governed under the Sunshine Law. They have to allow public testimony either at the beginning of the meeting or before an agenda item before the commission takes action. So you have that opportunity to provide oral written testimony or both. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, and. Uh, Peter reminded me we've got Ashley Kirkwoods going to appear at the November meeting to talk about a uh, grant, an NEA grant, I forget, um, that has been given to uh, help educate the public with art made with um, recycling, recycling um, plastic uh, and other garbage maybe. So anyway, she'll be on the agenda um, for next meeting. Anyone else? Like I said, as always, if you've got ideas or something you want to talk about, um, let me know and I'll try to work it into the agenda, Elise. Uh, thanks, Regine. Will you continue the item three of unfinished business at next month's meeting? Um, sure, we'll keep we'll keep coming back to that. Um, and maybe EPA will have issued it by then, but I doubt it. Fortunately, the federal government's slower than the county. So we probably have time to uh, get our act together. But yes, we'll we'll put that on the agenda as well. At least a status report on what's going on. And meantime, you guys are all going to be working on your own recommendations for priorities. And maybe we can give an official set of uh, recommendations to DEM and not just my thoughts. Okay. Um, announcements, uh, item eight. Um, speaking of meetings, um, Peter's not going to be able to make our regularly, or actually it was irregularly scheduled meeting for November 16. Uh, so I am uh, executive decision making, moving the meeting to November 30th. So after Thanksgiving, if people find they cannot make November 30 and we won't be able to pull quorum, let us know so that we can reschedule it again. Uh, and it'll be held in person in Hilo as well as continuing to um, do Zoom. Anybody have any immediate issues with that? Anything else? I hear a motion for adjournment. <laughs> so moved. You want a second? Second. second. Melissa, Andy. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you very much. I think it was a very informative meeting. See you Thank next you. time. Happy Thanksgiving, Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.